still off air. Okay. Well, thank you for joining us today uh, on another um, Minority Report Saturday Hangout. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Mike Lay. Mike uh, is a producer, a writer, and a filmmaker. And uh, Mike has a new hit show that I'm a huge fan of uh, called K Town, which is showcase uh, Koreans running around LA, partying, uh, living, uh, being young. And uh, it gives us a, a little insight and, and a little window into uh, the Asian community in, uh, in the West Coast. Uh, and also probably gives us a, a little window into what uh, young Asian people are doing all across the United States. So without further ado, hey Mike, how are you today? Pretty good. Good morning, guys. Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> oh, uh, so well, let me introduce myself then. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, my name is Mike Lee, and uh, you know, I was born in Vietnam. My family escaped the war in '75, so I came to the States when I was like a year old. Uh, I grew up in Minnesota, and then uh, moved to Florida around my high school years, and basically went to school in the Sarasota, Bradenton um, area of, of Florida. And then uh, after uh, you know spending some years in college and never fully graduating, I decided to um, just pursue my, my my dream of writing and 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 my passion for movies. So around the age of 23, I decided to just throw throw everything in my car and drive out west. You know, I found my apartment over the internet, didn't even see a photo of it, just called the manager up and said, you know what, save me a room. And so I didn't know anybody in LA, I didn't know anybody in the business, I just drove out intoxicated by my dreams of being in the business. And so uh, the very first job that I got uh, when I when I came to LA, was working at a Blockbuster video, and I was at Blockbuster for just about three months. When one day, uh, Owen Wilson and Cheryl Crow walks in. You know, they were dating at the time, right? So uh, I was behind the counter, and Owen Wilson comes up to me, and he's like, "I'm looking for two movies: The Producers and Smoke." I said, oh, "Okay, well, Producers is over there in comedy next to so and so, and Smoke's over there in the, in the drama section, you know, third aisle." And Owen gives me like this really curious look. Like he's like off off the top of your head like that where these movies were. I said, you know, I, I have I have a really good memory. I have a good mind for you know names and titles and concepts. And he gives me like this really curious look. He's like, oh, that's very interesting. So he walks away. He gets his movies, and then he and then he comes back to me, and then he goes, uh, are you interested in filmmaking? I said, well, you know, I, I just moved to LA. You know, I, I want to write. He goes, oh, th that's very interesting. And that's all we talked about. So he leaves. And then literally the next day, Owen Wilson calls me at Blockbuster. And he's like, do you want to be my assistant? And so I was like, uh, of course. So I literally uh, um, quit Blockbuster on the spot. And, and, I, and I worked for Owen Wilson, Luke Wilson, and director Wes Anderson for basically three years. Uh, Owen Wilson did Shanghai Noon because of me. I you know, uh, typed up all, you know, all of their scripts. And then um, ultimately I ended up selling a script myself to Fox uh, and parted ways with them. And so I was writing full time for a while. And then I met uh, the actor Tyrese Gibson. And Tyrese and I started writing scripts together. Um, and, uh, and then when he opened up his company, HQ Pictures, which is a film and TV production company, he asked me to run it. So, you know, unlike most people who were VPs at companies who've like climbed the ladder from assistant to director of development to creative exec, I actually went straight to VP, so it was def definitely sort of like bapti you know, baptism by fire, you know, kind of job. And uh, you know, during during my time at HQ, we set up feature projects all over town. We produced a reality show for BET called First In, which was about the Compton Fire Department. We uh, published this best-selling comic book called Mayhem through through Image Comics, and uh, and uh, and so then um, you know, after after running Tyrese's company for for a few years, I decided to get back to writing full time. And so I'm, you know, still Tyrese's producing partner on a project by project basis, but now I'm I'm I'm, I'm writing projects. I'm you know developing a script uh, for, for for Disney right now. I have another script that um, that, uh, that that's going to be over at Universal. So uh, aside from juggling my writing projects, we're also producing. 
and that's where you know the K Town project comes in. You know, I'm producing K Town with Tyrese and you know Ben Silverman and a team, a great team. You know, Eddie Kim and Eugene Choi, and uh, it's been it's been a great success for 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 the Lao channel uh, on YouTube that they've ordered some more shows from us. So we're uh, we're about to do that and a bunch of other things. Can I can I just give a little bit of parental advisory uh, for the kids who are watching out there? You know, don't try this at home. If you drop out of college, drive across the country, work at Starbucks, thinking that you get into the show business, chances are you still be working at Starbucks. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm. I'm very lucky. I'm very fortunate. I, well, you know, luck has a little bit to play with it, but you also have your your skill set. It's something that 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 uh, Owen saw. And that Tyree saw in you that you know obviously it was outside of the box, you know, out out of the norm. They just don't go to every blockbuster and pick a kid out and, and say, "Hey, run well, I, I think I think passion and passion and and um, and enthusiasm uh, does work. And obviously, in in his industry, also talent. Yes, yes, yes. and and you know, in 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 starting business, talking to VCs and all that. You get you get your door slammed on you, you know, a thousand times out of a thousand. But once in a while, someone who says, "Oh, I met you so many years ago, and I remember that, and you were you were so full of shit, but you were excited, and I remember, you know." And and it just that comes across. Passion and, and enthusiasm do come across. So so you mentioned ba a trial baptism by fire. Uh, right. And I find that I, I like that phrase. So my question is. What was the hardest thing for you, uh, business-wise, uh, to deal with when when coming into this industry? You know, obviously you are a creative talent talent guy, and usually creative and talent types are not really great at the business side of it. That's why they have business managers and all that stuff. Right, right. But obviously, you being an assistant and running a production company, you have to deal with all those aspects. So, what was your biggest surprise? A in yourself. And B, what challenges did it present to you when you had no background in, in business or entrepreneurship? Right, right. Um, you know, <clears throat> my biggest surprise about this business, honestly, is how nice everyone is. I know, I know, everyone uh, thinks Hollywood is this like you know cutthroat, ruthless place, which it is, which it is. But when you're working at the studio level and you're working with like major talents and major you know, producers and directors and and these big wig you know executives and and, and agents, uh, they understand that this is a business of 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 relationships. And me being the assistant to someone like Owen Wilson, they understood that I was the extension of who Owen Wilson was. So they had to be nice to me, because they you know to to get to Owen Wilson, you you had to get get get, get through me first. Um, now in terms of <clears throat> And in terms of like the juggling the business aspects and, and and being a creative, I think the hardest part was learning when to pass off the business part because uh, even though I am uh, you know uh, a writer slash producer, there's a reason why I have a lawyer is because you know like um, I just don't speak the language of contracts uh, and and uh, and so th that's you know the hardest part is sometimes you know, when do you as an executive you're negotiating deals, but then when do you pass it on to your lawyer? You know, yeah. you, you, that kind of thing. Um, and so, you know, uh, the other big surprise is, especially for reality TV, is how much everybody wants to get into reality TV and 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 the quick turnaround time. Like like for, you know, for example, in movies, the average time, the average, the average amount of years for it to get from script to screen is like five to seven years, mm -hmm. right? Uh, in TV, it's much it's 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 much quicker. For example, when we initially shot the sizzle reel for K Town, and we sold it to a network, uh, that was nine months. Yeah, yeah. So, so it, it's really quick. The 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 chasm between filmmaking and reality television, the production is just lightning speed. I want right. to go back to I want to go back to what you said about how people are nice to you. Um, you know, in business. Turns out that there are a lot of nice people too. Um, you just have to find them. <laughs> um, but I, I guess what I'm saying is that how much of that is you? How much of that is your personality? I mean, because people are, you know, that, that's that's in a way is is you're your own product, right? You're your own brand, and you're right. differentiating yourself by being 
genuine and sincere. That's got to count for something, right? How much of that? How much of that is actually just the way you are? Um, I, you know, I mean, I, I, am am I the one to 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 judge that? I mean, I, well, I, I don't know. Well, I mean, this flipped it. Uh, I'm sure you've seen a lot of people who try to do, who are trying to come up through the through the system, right? Right. And and didn't make it not because their their lack of talent, it just just the, their personality. They they yeah. made it difficult for themselves, right? I'm sure yeah, you've absolutely. seen that. Yeah, absolutely, and I think <clears throat> I think it, it it goes back to 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 what you're saying about passion, right? Is is yeah. passion is very infectious. People want to be around passionate people. I mean, this this business is so hard, and you are committing to, you know, like years of your life to a single project. You only do that if you're passionate about something, right? And so there are people who move to LA, who say they want to do all these things. You know, they're you know, it's a, it's it's an old cliche where we're like the they're the jack of all trades, but like master of none. They want to act, they want to write, they want to produce, they want to do all these things, but they're passionate about neither of it. They're just passionate about the idea of doing those things. Uh, yeah. And so and and That's so a great distinction right there. Right. Yeah. And and so <laughs> and so then you know they 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 come across a heartbreak after a heartbreak, and they become jaded very easily. And within a year to two two years, they blame LA. They don't blame themselves. They blame the business. They 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 blame Hollywood for having these walls that keep out quote unquote talented people, when in reality, you know, they they basically did you know did it to to themselves. So, I read an article about you, uh, and and it struck a chord with me because, uh, you know, I, I believe that almost every immigrant goes through this to through this phase, you know, where. You know, you, you you immigrate to the United States uh, from a third world country, and uh, maybe you go move into a city where there's not a lot of people like you. You know, right? right. Uh, and uh, as you grow, you go through school and you grow up. You 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 want to distance yourself from from basically what what you know what Americans the words they use is your roots. You know, um, you want to become as American as possible and as less as what you are as possible. Right. Right. So you can fit in. I mean, it's it's a survival skill. Right. But I love the part in the article when it actually came full circle. When you when you actually embraced uh, your roots and 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 that epiphany that you had driving that night, you know, from from that club. Right. And so talk a little bit about that. Okay. All right. <clears throat> yeah. I um. I, I admittedly for a good deal of my life was a self-hating Asian. You know, I, I uh, grew up in Minnesota where there were a few Asian people. I, I was very, I was trained to like being the token Asian because I was always the, I was always the token Asian. And um, The one I, Asian friend. What's that? The one Asian friend. Oh yeah, exactly. I have one of those. Exactly, exactly. Um, so and, you have uh, a stamp, and you stamp people's passport. Is this, you've been through Asian, now you have Asian friends. <laughs> um, yeah, and 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 the Asians that were around in, in Minnesota, a lot of them were, uh, you know, it, it, what 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 we call fobs, like like fresh off the boat, right? Mm -hmm. And so like like in, in grade school, they were the loud ones who were like ran around, you know, in the hallways playing tag and like. You know, you know, bringing bring their quote unquote smelly food from home and stuff like that. So that was stuff like I was so embarrassed about that that it, it pushed me away even further. And 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 as you know, all I hung out with were non Asians. Well, how much of that is also from home? How much of that is uh, your parents wanting you to be Asian? You know, I mean, uh, my my parents never said like you know you should you should you should stay Asian or 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 stay Vietnamese. They they. They just let me me. They just let me be me. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, but they, you know, I, I watched a lot of TV as a kid, and so that was a huge influence on me as well. So, um, and so, uh, it, it wasn't until I, you know I moved to LA where I started to be around more Asian people that I started to embrace being Asian again. And um, you know that 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 night where. Um, uh, you know, Christian is, is talking about me coming home from a club, is because you know one morning I was driving home, fr you know, from a club and I saw this homeless guy standing on the corner, and he and he had a sign that says you know Vietnam vet need help, right? And at that moment I I I realized that 
me being a product of the Vietnam War and how my family escaped it and how there were people out there who sacrificed for my family to be in America, I've never ever thanked a Vietnam vet. And so I pulled over and I um, rolled on my window and I asked him, so were you really uh, in the war? And, and he said, you, he, he like rattled off some unit that, 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 he, like, that, you know, that he was in. And so I reached over and I shook his hand. I said, you know what, I've never, you know, I'm Vietnamese and I've never thanked a Vietnamese vet before. So on behalf of my family, behalf of my people, and behalf of myself, who have the luxury to be in this business, I thank you. And he literally grabbed my hand and trembled. Like he broke down in tears, and that's never happened to me before. And so at that moment, <clears throat> I, I realized by being a self-hating Asian, by not, in, you know, by, not by, by taking for granted who I am, I was doing this man a great disservice who signed his name on the dotted line to sacrifice for people that he never thought he would ever meet. And so who am I to complain about, you know, waiting in line at the DMV or like stuck in traffic when, uh, when people like him are, are like, you know, on the streets. And so, you know, de developing and, and a prison K town was a part of that kind of like that transformation for me, you know, <clears throat> Aaron Sorkin, you know, theorizes that uh, Facebook was, you know, like like Mark Zuckerberg created Facebook to create Mark Zuckerberg. I basically created K Town to create Mike Lee. Yeah, I, I like that. Yeah, cool. <clears throat> well, um, there's a there's a little bit of of background too. I I, I came to uh, United States in the early '70s, and that time we talk a lot about melting pot, and the implication of melting pot is that you're supposed to lose yourself. You're supposed to be one. And that actually creates a lot of difficulty for people who are not of the norm, whether racially or, or culturally. And so I, we all went through that. And, and the transition was, was when we started to talk about 200% personality, that you're not 50% 50, 50 here and 50% here, but you can be 100% Vietnamese and 100% Americans. Yeah. So one of the things that comes to watching K-Town is that I'm not watching Koreans. I'm watching 100% Americans doing the thing who also happens to be 100% Koreans. Mm. Uh, that's good then. That's a good analogy. I, I like that. Because, yeah, th there's, there's probably, you know, I mean, it, it, it's, it's something that you can't understand unless you have immigrated somewhere. To completely uproot yourself from where you were. And Listen, if I were to move to Tennessee and live next door to water, I'll be an immigrant again. Okay, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was going to say that's regional. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's 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 that experience is quite universal. Well, imagine imagine um, and, and imagine that you see this is where Mike and I are kind of kind of similar because we both immigrate to cities that are not known for. As, as cultural centers, you know, Atlanta at the time, yeah. you know, 20 years ago, you know, I had to really drive to find another Hispanic, you know, right. uh, and the one that I did find didn't speak any English. <laughs> 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 I'm sorry, didn't speak any Spanish. Yeah. You know, he, he was born here, so he never never learned Spanish. Uh -huh. so, so it's one thing to move to L.A. or San Francisco or New York. Or Chicago, you know, where you have large general immigrants, but it's another thing to move somewhere where there's no one, you know. Especially Minnesota. I mean, what was the train of thought there originally? <laughs> Just get no. out when they get out. No, but back then, when when the boat people came to U.S., they 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 would have to go to a place where there are sponsors. Yeah, and they a lot of times oh, they're yeah. sponsored okay. by churches. So that's where. You know, they that's where they put them. They put they put all these all these people that normally live in tropical weather and they say, Where are the closest plot in, in the United yeah, States? We'll put them spot we can put them in. And see how they would work out. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a trial trial by weather more than anything. Yeah, else, absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, my, I, I like to go back to something Mike said of, of, uh, about that passion and the and the passion that we could see within him, uh, you know, readily. Uh, and it's the the breakdown of that ideal function which is 
the idea is I want to do these things, but without passion for any single entity within, you know, a broad scope, then nothing gets done. And, and that is a, a great analogy for, for young entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs of all ages, because until you have passion about at least one single idea, it's like focusing all of your, your capabilities to get something accomplished. If you look at everything and think you're passionate about it, then you're, you're, you get nothing done at all. But when you single out the one thing, and I'm sure he can you know, tell us more about how, what his process is to break down ideas and concepts uh, and get on a project, but it's essentially the same thing with an entrepreneur because they have to break down all these grand ideas they have to start yeah. and it's actually balance. focus on getting something moving. That's that's great. It's a, it's a balance between inspiration and execution. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. And and I think my my I, I wonder if, if Mike can speak to that because a lot of times you you have to have a vision that is bigger than what you can do immediately, right? Because it if, if you just say, look, I just want to I just want to I just want to be an assistant. Well, okay, that's 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 something you can it's, it it can be achieved. Um, maybe not for most people, but it, you know, if you think that you can achieve it, you can stop there. But you need more, right? So if you if if you want to ultimately be like, I I remember um, asking Mike. I said, well, what what is the if if you if you could do everything along the way, what would be the ultimate? He says, well, I want to. I think I think you told me that you want to be a director for a a kung fu movie, right? <laughs> and that to me, like, wow! <laughs> After all this, you wanted to be. <laughs> well, <clears throat> you know, I think, I think, Dwayne, I, I agree that sometimes you, you, it's, it's okay to say, okay, I, I'm passionate about this, passionate about this, but you got to have that one driving force that push you. And in fact, let's talk about rejection. Because that's a that's the hardest thing, right? Because if you talk about having a motivation, that motivation is not just to is is to push you towards towards something, but it's also to kind of let you deal with the rejection, the store that slam on you day after day. How do you do that, Mike? Right. Well, <clears throat> well, yeah. I mean, this, this once again it ties beautifully back back into passion. Because you, know, I'm a firm, I'm a firm believer that passion gives purpose. If you're not passionate about anything, what is your purpose? You know, like well, it could be something as if you're passionate about your church, then that's your purpose. If you're passionate about, you know, you know, uh, helping kids or or being a doctor or or a writer or a poet, whatever, that's your purpose. And um, and so that's 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 the thing. You know, passion is what is, is what uh, fights laziness. Passion is is, is what. You know, <clears throat> cures you of like the heartbreaks and the and the <clears throat> and the many no's that you that you face in business, and so, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> you know, one of how do you deal with it? You just kind of like be, the first and foremost is that it's 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 your passion for your art, it's your passion for what you're doing, and everything else just doesn't really matter. I think I think the the one thing I I think. I think you said this earlier a little bit in passing is the only way you could deal with rejection is that you don't make it about you. Right. You don't take it per you don't just say hey, you know, and that's something that 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 I want to get to is is that you know, we talk a lot about discrimination. We talk a lot about, you know, uh prejudice. Now the discrimination could be about your 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 race, your skin color, your culture, your sexual preference. It could just be about your inexperience. Mm -hmm. So it's very easy to confuse rejection with discrimination, right? Right. right. And I, my experience is that you just you go home, you know, you get rejected, you go home, and you you ask yourself, what can I learn from this, right? Right. How do I pick up my pieces and I'm going to go back there and do it again, right? Right. Yeah, I I, I would totally agree with that because I found that. One of the best tools that I've ever come across is, you know, when you do get rejected or when you get told no, you know, in the business world, one of one of the greatest things that I've learned is to go back to that person that told you no and say, can you tell me why? Yes. And because yes. you end up getting a wealth of knowledge that yes. you can just incorporate into your next pitch or yes. your, you know, your next idea. Yeah. Uh, and, and I and I also find that people are willing to tell you. 
you've taken you've taken their answer of no, and you're not yeah. you know badgering them. You're just asking them, hey, why? What I do wrong? The, the or, people who we really don't care about you, you never hear from them. They, exactly. They don't, they don't even bother to say, to say no, right? It, right? It's like it's like going to the doctors and and and, and getting a shot. Your body is going to react. It's going to reject that needle because it's not a good thing, right? No matter no matter how much you think that that is going to help you, you know, in preventing disease and stuff. Or your body is smarter than you. your body is saying that thing. It's got a pointy pointy. That pointy thing is not good for me. And and I think your body tells you when someone gives you criticism, your body puts up this defense, and 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 you just have to overcome that. You know, you just have to tell you know tell the rest of your body to calm down, right? This is not about you. And I think Dwayne said it. You know, go back to the guy. Think about it. Go back to the guy. I, I think about it. Every night I think about all the things that happen. And when someone says no, I said, well, why did they say no? What did they see in me that I didn't see today? Right? Right. <clears throat> yeah. And so, so people do know, say no in Hollywood, huh? People do say no in Hollywood. But, you know, <laughs> going, going back to your point. Going back to your point about how, like, sometimes those rejections, like, <clears throat> some people unfairly think it's discrimination. Yeah. Hollywood is is in the business of making money. They don't care <clears throat> what race you are. I mean, Hollywood, I, I feel, is the great uh, is the great equalizer because there are so many people in this town who are successful, who never went to the best schools, who who didn't come from money who was not born in into the business all hollywood cares is that are you able to deliver and are you able to deliver you know, consistently sure. and so <clears throat> um, you know, there was this recent recent controversy about how warner brothers uh, bought the rights to this anime this very you know famous anime film called called akira and, <clears throat> and so <clears throat> excuse me akira was you know it's originally set in japan with an all asian you know cast of characters but warner brothers was going to move it to New York and make it an all-white cast, right? And the movie was going to be like over $100 million. So there was <clears throat> all of this controversy about how, why is Hollywood whitewashing what is supposed to be this, this Asian cast? Well, the truth of the matter is, is that there is no Asian American out there who can carry a $100 million you know, dollar film. That's just business. You know, there is no Asian Will Smith. You know, and, and, and that's not Hollywood's fault. It's, I think, a cultural problem. <clears throat> you know, people, people always ask me, why, why, why does Hollywood hate Asian actors? My response to that is that Hollywood doesn't hate, hate Asian actors. Asian parents hate Asian actors. Because, <laughs> <laughs> because they never encourage their kids to pursue a life in the arts. And so it's not until this generation, this younger generation of, of, of Asian parents that I think that's going to change. So. Well, uh by your own admission, you used to be a reality TV snob. You know, right. you're a filmmaker. You started in film filmmaking. Some might see that as a downgrade. You know, going from you aspire to reach filmmaking. Filmmaker, you may start in TV, but you always aspire to be in on the big screen. And uh, you know, I used to share those feelings where I, I used to be a snob. You know, once upon a time, you know, on the company that did special effects for films in Hollywood, uh, but. I've become a huge fan of reality TV for what I call it, you know, guilty pleasure, voyeurism. What made you change your mind? Why reality TV now? Well, you know, I think my initial gut reaction uh, against reality TV is, is the same reason why a lot of people don't like reality TV, which is they think th that, that it's not real, right? Like, 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 like there's no such thing as like reality TV. <clears throat> and so, um, because it just seems so forced and manufactured. But then I realized nothing is reality. Even even an Oscar-winning documentary is told from a POV. It's edited. It's like, you know, it's it's framed from a perspective. Uh, even the news is, is framed from a perspective. The only thing that is like real reality is like a static security camera shot. Yeah. And where's the fun in that, right? No, and no so, fun. Exactly. <clears throat> and so... Once I realized that you know reality TV is just another form of storytelling, and 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 uh, you know I, I'm a storyteller, and so you know that's when I just start, I start to embrace it. Awesome. Um, well, entrepreneurs actually are also storytellers because 
I remember one time, I, either when my son or somebody young asked me, he says, Dad, what's the difference between sales and marketing? And I said, well, they're both sales. It's just that one sales shit you don't have. So <laughs> it's, it's storytelling, right? It's storytelling not in the sense of lying. It's a storytelling in the sense that it's something that is real, that exists in your head, and you're trying to convey that to someone else. It's a vision. It's a it's it's communication. It's a vision right. communicating your vision. Yeah. So so obviously somebody as successful as you you know have many avenues for distribution. Yet I find I find very interesting that you have embraced for the distribution of K Town, uh, new media. Um, you know YouTube. That that's where the episodes were originally released. Right. Can, you, can you talk a little bit about behind that decision? Uh, what what prompted you to choose YouTube as a distribution channel for the show? Sure. Um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, sure. A little uh, bit, a little bit of background on on loud channel would be nice too. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, so basically, yeah, you you know how Google, uh, well, YouTube wa wants to get into the original content business, and right. and it's because. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everyone is, <clears throat> because every year, less and less people are watching traditional TV, and they're streaming it, and they're watching it online, or or they're downloading it illegally, right? And so, if everyone from Hulu to obviously Netflix has has their own you know shows now. Um, everyone is every, everyone is 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 looking to digital now, and so uh, Google funded YouTube, uh, like a hundred channels, right? And they gave Electus, which is a company ran by Ben Silverman, who is the former head of, uh, 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 who's the former president of NBC. And while while over at NBC, he produced like The Office and Biggest Loser and and Ugly Betty. And so he eventually left NBC to start Electus. And so they gave Electus a lot of money to start three channels: a a a food channel called Hungry, a Spanish channel called Nuevon, and a pop culture channel called Loud. Okay. And so. And so we, uh, our, our show, K Town, is the flagship uh, is a flagship show on Loud. And so you know, we initially sold K Town to E to the E Network, right? right? And and you know, our experience over over there was was you know not the greatest, but eventually you know we 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 got the show back. And when we got the show back, um, Electus called us and says, "Hey, put it on the Loud channel." And you know, my my initial reaction to re reaction to that was, oh, really, we're we're gonna put the show on on online now, you know, like there's like so so much Asian American content on YouTube. I said, you know, we're gonna get lost in there, or or it's just like there there's a stigma to 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 it be on web and, and stuff like that. And uh, um, I I hope uh, 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 Mr. Mio doesn't mind me saying this, but you know, uh, I I I date his daughter. And so his, his That's why you still call me Mr. Mew. I noticed that. Yes, yes, yes. That's like <laughs> and, so, and so and so uh, um, his daughter is you know a little younger than me, right? And so the first time she came over to my place and she saw my large DVD collection, she says she, she said to me, "You're a very peculiar person." Uh, <laughs> why do you have so much plastic? <laughs> right? That's well, calling you all, man. That's calling you all. Exactly. And so, like, I go, I go, why? Oh. She goes, and so she's, she's like, I don't know anybody that buys DVDs. Like, we, <laughs> we stream everything, right? And yeah. so, it, it, that was actually the one of the biggest reasons why I was like, okay, <clears throat> we need to put Kate down on YouTube. Yeah, that perspective from from that Y generation. That perspective from that Y generation, it, as opposed to us, a little bit older guys, you know, uh, Mike, uh, where we grew up uh, with traditional distribution of content. But you know, I have a lot of uh, people in this younger generation that work for me in different businesses, and, and it's good to get that perspective because they let you know what the next trends are. So, uh, so. Do you do you consider that that this uh, decision to go with YouTube has been a positive one? Uh, what do you see for the future of of entertainment and media on on non traditional distribution channels like YouTube and Hulu and Netflix? Right, right. <clears throat> yeah, I, I think I think it was a great choice for us because um, I'm not sure if the networks are ready to take a risk on an all Asian cast yet. 
you know, the, 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 the last all Asian cast on TV was I think Margaret Cho's show back in the early nineties mm-hmm. called All you know, All American Girl. And then mm-hmm. even even with that show, it, it you know, they started to add more white people to it and, and and stuff like that. And so what 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 we're doing is we're trying to change the paradigm of de- of development in Hollywood, which is we're 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 building an audience online. We're building a product online. We're 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 building these established views and 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 this and this established audience. So when we do pitch to networks, we're we're we're, we're saying, look, this isn't just an idea. This isn't just a sizzle reel. This is two seasons of a show with a built-in audience and a running social media engine. Uh, c- collectively, like we have like 20 million views on K Town, right? Yeah. So 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 we can like those are hard numbers, and and stats where we can say our biggest audience is. North America, Canada, Australia, you know, Korea. That, that you know, this is what our YouTube stat says, and so and so like these are hard numbers and 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 data that we can go to, and that we can go to, to the networks, and it, it just makes them, you know, it it it, it 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 opens it up so so that it's an easier yes for them. Well, we in 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 entrepreneurship, we always said, don't ask for permission, ask for forgiveness, right? right. And so, YouTube or more, more precisely, the the idea that you can narrow cast as opposed to broadcast, because with YouTube you you can target if if you think there's a thousand people out there who are interested in your genre, you can target those thousand people, and so the the cost of barrier is much lower. It allows you to actually go out there and try something and not having to ask for permission, because you could always ask for forgiveness. Now talking about forgiveness. And talking about and on behalf of our Asian parents, I re, I believe the reason K, one reason K Tang is successful is because all of the Asian parents are asked uh, are forbidden the kids from watching the show. <laughs> <laughs> and so I suspect your your biggest critics, the people that are really bitter about what you do, are people who have some one reason or another wanted to defend something. Right. How do you deal with that? That must hurt. You know, it's it's interesting. It's it's when when they defend it though, it's it's it, the the way for like like for for example, they would say something like, "This is not this is not how Asian people are supposed to act," you know, which is an ignorant statement because there is there is no you can't act a race. You are you 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 are who you are as an individual, and so you know. I read these YouTube comments, and they say things like, um, "You know, I've watched this, and now I've lost all respect for Asian people." Well, if 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 watching some reality show online makes you lose lose respect for Asian people, that respect was fragile to begin with, right? Um, and 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 you know, I, I think um, you know going you know going going back to what you said about this this older generation of Asian people who who criticized the show, I think it's because one of the things that and some I... some of them are not even Asian. Some of them are, are people who decided that they need to protect Asians. Right, right, right. Well, that, well, see, that's because they have this preconceived notion of what Asian people are, which is like this model minority myth, right? It's this, it's this myth that there, are, there are, that there is such a thing as good stereotypes. There are no good stereotypes, right? And, 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 and you bring an interesting point which is one of the most important questions that I wanted to ask you because Asians, you know, uh, what we call Asians in America, which are very many different, you know, races, you know, Vietnamese, Chinese, Koreans, Cambodians, you know, they don't always see eye to eye within, within each other's communities. Right. But Asians as a, as a whole in the United States are probably some of the most misunderstood and enigmatic minorities because we don't see your lives on traditional media, we don't see. And, your and lives. we're we no. usually occupy ourselves by hating each other. <laughs> right. Yeah, well, but but you know, almost every other race is depicted somehow on traditional media, on television. There's a reality show about, about black people, a reality right. show about Hispanics, a reality show about white people all the time. So it, we hardly ever see or have an uh, uh, insight into the Asian community, the many Asian communities. Uh, it's kind of around the United States. So, so you know, it, it, was this an attempt to shed a light and to maybe nudge the older generations to break away from that notion that we have to pro- 
portray ourselves as perfect to the outside world? Oh, absolutely. I think, you know, um, you know, go, going back to what I'm saying is that, you know, there are, you know, like, I, I think I'll, too many Asian people have uh, uh, bought into the myth that there are good stereotypes, that Asian people are good at math, that we're, you know, hard workers, and we play the piano, and stuff like that. And that is just as you're saying that I'm a smart guy because I'm Asian is just as insidious as saying a black guy is lazy because he's black. Because those are both judgments on who we are as a race and not who we are as a person. Well, I remember one one dinner when we we went out. I went out with my wife and 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 Mel, my daughter, and and my son, and we we're sitting around a table in a restaurant. And I asked my kids. I said, um. If some person walk up to you and says, "I hate you because you're Chinese," or your fa your parents are Chinese ancestors, is that discrimination? And they quickly said, "Yes, yes," because they just started in school and they were kind of um, getting exposed to this concept. And then I said, "Well, but what if the same person comes to you and says, "I really like you," and the reason I like you is because you're Chinese or your your parents are Chinese ancestors? Is that discrimination?" They said, "No." I said, "Yes, it is." Mm. Yes, 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 it is. And and actually, I I I always pong on this concept of victimhood. People should stop behaving like victims, whatever it is, whether it's some injustice done to you yesterday or three hundred years ago. You have to stop thinking that you are a victim. You are not nobody. You you are a victim when you think you are a victim, and. If you believe that you are from a victim class, the only way that you can elevate yourself is the only way you can liberate yourself is to be able to accept both the good and the bad. So it is just as bad for Asian parents to think that their kids has to be a doctor or a lawyer or they have to play the piano, like you said. I, I assume you played the piano when you were young. I did. Yes. <laughs> I can tell. <laughs> Oh, and it's just as bad as saying it's exactly just exactly as you said. It's it's just, it's just as bad as saying that. Well, then we're it's you can't go out and drink like that, or you can't go out and you know be promiscuous like that. Uh, you you just can't have it both ways. If you if you if you don't want to be a victim, you can't have it both ways like that. It would be the same as 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 someone saying that. Well, because you're an immigrant background, you couldn't be against immigrant reform. Well, that's bullshit. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I mean, that's it for my questions. I just wanted to say that I'm a huge, huge fan of the show. Uh, you know, I've been saving season two for oh, really? for yeah, I've been saving it for when I go into the into the hospital for my son being born, so I have something to watch. Okay, great. Um, <laughs> wow. I think I I took a little detour from season one to season two because I was not aware that season two was already out on mm -hmm. out. And then uh, I started watching House of Cards. So that kind of was a big time suck. Sure, sure. Uh, but I've been saving season two like a really good dinner so I can consume it all. While <laughs> I'm so are you, are you a binge viewer? Oh, yes, I am. Okay. So, so I, I do like you know this this not having to wait week to week to watch and now that everything is out. You know, I, I know that. Actually, that's another question. What what why release it on a weekly schedule like traditional television instead of doing the same thing that Netflix does with House of Cards, which release all thirteen episodes at one time. Because we found that uh, releasing it um, on a weekly schedule. Gives us time to build an audience. Okay. You know, uh, and, and and it gives us time to build our, our social media engine and to have engagement with the audience over time. Uh, and I think if we release all all at once, I, I it'll be we won't have that sort of traction to like uh, reach out on a weekly basis to people. Excellent. Well, also the, you you allow people to watch it together somehow. Right, it right. becomes more of a, uh, a a social event. Right, right, right. So uh, that's all. You know, that's all. I very. Uh, th th have you watched? Um, um, have you watched House of Cards in, in Netflix? Have uh, you done that yet? 
Uh, me? No, not not yet. Uh, but I will. Yeah. Yeah. Because because I think what what I think Christian have right. Yeah, the whole thing. Yeah, because wow. because that's that's revolution. I did too. I did I did the whole thing over one weekend, because that's actually very revolutionary. You have all of them at one place. You don't have to wait, um, which means that the show they don't the shows become more of a continuation of one another rather than these artificial build up at the end to kind of get you to come back next week. The fact that they're not on a schedule, they they're not on a on a one hour time slot, meaning that the the, the length of the show doesn't need to be optimized around around a schedule. Um, I mean everything everything is new. Everything so so going back to to um, what you said about whether or not going to YouTube is a good decision. Well a lot of times you you know it is what it is, right? It's an opportunity that comes to you right. at the time. So it's 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 not like you could do a double blind experiment. But I think going forward is absolutely the right choice. So so my what advice do you have for? It, it, it could be general advice uh, on entrepreneurship, but what advice do you have for for somebody that's trying to break into the business? Uh, uh, and now with the tools that are, are available to us, you know that, that we can, you know, you can buy an inexpensive camera, right, right, and have some, <laughs> some some skills, and you can go out and produce something, make right. something. Right. What advice do you have for somebody that's trying to break into the business? Let me let me add to that. Um, actually, uh, you, Christian kind of mentioned that is that, is that you know anybody can just get, they can they can even make something out of an iPhone now, right? Uh, that, that's that's a very nice um, video camera. Uh, and and a Nexus uh, Four, by the way. Uh, just so you know, <laughs> you know, any 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 device could do it, not just. But the point is. You, in, there's something about K-Town. It's it's very professionally produced. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Yes. I mean that's the one thing I really like. And maybe so so go ahead and, and answer the question, and then maybe the follow up is is talk about some of the talent behind the scene because we see so much talent in front of right. the scene. Right. 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 <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, yeah. In terms of my advice about breaking in, uh, for those who are interested in breaking into Hollywood, my number one advice of advice is to move to L.A. I, uh, because, <clears throat> like, like I said, like being discovered at a blockbuster video by Owen Wilson doesn't happen anywhere else, right? If you want to work in, <clears throat> if you want to work on Broadway, you move to New York, right? If you want to be like a Vegas showgirl, you move, you you move to Vegas. So if you want to work, if you want to work in movies or, or TV, you get you got to move to LA. That's the number one thing. I mean, it's the heart, of, it's the heart of the industry. It's it, it's it's where uh, it's it's where all the opportunities are. And you know, and so you know, it's like when I first moved to LA, uh, there were there were very few books on screenwriting. There were no message boards online or or like internet groups of screenwriters. There are there are tons of those today, and they all tell you how hard it is to move to LA, how you you need to like have so much saved up, and you need to like you know like it's almost like to the point where it's discouraging. I one of my most useful tool when I when when I first broke in was the fact that I was very naive. So I was so naive that all of those odds didn't really play in, in the, into my head. So so yeah, that, that, that's that, that's my advice is to just some sometimes you just have to you just have to do it because life rewards action. Well, I, I have and, to and ask, you, go ahead, Walter. Oh, thank you. Um, I have to ask a follow up to that. Okay. Uh, out here in the sticks, away from LA. Really popular for local governments to sponsor uh, funds to draw you folks out into the rest of the world, right? And uh, produce shows and so forth. A lot of incentive programs out there. Do you really see that in Hollywood? Do you even get impacted by that? Oh yeah, I mean, <clears throat> uh, it's, it's it's expensive to shoot in in LA. That's why we we that's why we're always shooting in New Mexico. <laughs> or, or or like all these other places because of the, of the tax breaks and stuff like that. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah, I, I, absolutely, it, it affects us. And and I think a lot of a lot of the business is 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 kind of bitter of the fact that there's so many great you know better deals out there than you know. Yeah, even Canada. I guess absolutely. Vancouver is a big center. Yeah, yeah. Wow, interesting. Like you know, like ja Jackie Chan's Rumble in the Bronx. That Bronx was shot in Toronto. <laughs> you know, uh, and, and, 
and, and here in Atlanta, there's a huge now TV industry because of those tax incentives. You know, some studios opening up here. Right. You know, so you know, I, I see the the production trucks all over the, all over the city now because there's uh, any given moment there's you know a couple of movies being shot here in the city or or three or four TV shows you know that that call Georgia their home. So right, right, absolutely. Well, I don't have anything else for you, Mike. Uh, I don't know if some of the panels have any other questions, but you know, on behalf of myself and the panel, I just want to say you know thank you for for coming on and. And answering a question, I knew you were reluctant uh, to come in because you don't see yourself as, as an entrepreneur. But you know, uh, in our books, you are the definition of entrepreneurship. You know. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. And and maybe before we sign off, give us a, a glimpse of your your some of your spinoffs that you're working on in K Town. Oh, oh uh, <clears throat> I can't officially announce anything. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Just well, anybody daily, has lawyers. I want to see the dailies. Yeah, said, sure. <laughs> Listen, absolutely, anytime. <laughs> okay, oh, any anything else? This is a great this is a great show. Anything else? That was a great show. I uh, appreciate uh, you sharing uh, all the information you did, and I thought it was uh, pretty insightful uh, when you reached out to that VM, uh, VM, uh, Vietnam War veteran. Right. Uh, that was that was pretty cool. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Well, I'm going to be coming to San Francisco next year to visit Danny, your father-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> You're scaring everybody now. Yeah. And, and, and I and I, I want to go and I want to go see you in LA because I, I I like I said I want to see the dailies of your next well, next. Listen, next time you're in LA, you come and party with me in the cast in K Town. Oh, uh, that's awesome. oh my gosh! <laughs> and then you're gonna let me that lawyer of yours so I can get divorced, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I come party with you, but I don't know if with a part. I I don't know if I can hang with that cast. <laughs> they look scary to me. Okay, guys, thank you very much. Thank you, appreciate it. Thank you, thank you very see much. You, see you next Bye. Saturday. Some of you next Saturday. Thank you. <laughs>